<clears throat> uh, good morning. Uh, well, after this... Ah. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Nicholas Campion from the Centre for the Study of Cosmology and Culture at the University of Wales at Lampeter. And after this morning's uh, often quite uh, detailed presentations, I'm going to move swiftly into giving a global overview extending over uh, much of Western culture for several thousand years. So astronomy and political theory. So um, the issue here is that in terms of uh, the transmission and history of ideas, the dialogue between astronomy and cosmology and the organization of society, i.e. politics, occurs in almost all human cultures. And the dialogue can be two ways. So politics may influence astronomy and cosmology, and astronomy and cosmology may influence politics. So my paper is specifically concerned with European culture. And I do wish to mention a couple of other papers at this conference that have touched on territory I'm going to move into, but from different cultures. So particularly Sun uh, Xiao Shun on China and uh, Rajesh Kokar, who spoke about uh, India. Now, <clears throat> what is the problem? Well, uh, while books by uh, some political, on some political theorists deal with their cosmology and astronomy, this is almost entirely ignored by writers on political theory themselves. So my example here is that if you read a work on the philosophy of Aristotle or Plato, the Greek philosophers, by classicists, those works will deal with both their cosmology and astronomy and their political theory, their views on how society should be managed and organized. But when you come to uh, academic studies uh, of political theory, produced within political theory departments in our universities, um, the role of cosmology and astronomy is almost completely ignored. So if, for example, you pick up a textbook on medieval or Renaissance political theory, there will be some reference of Plato and Aristotle, but their cosmological theories and astronomy will be completely excluded, an act of uh, bizarre historical censorship. Now, <clears throat> my guiding quotation here is from the French philosopher Bruno Latour, uh, Latour set himself up in uh, opposition to both modernist and postmodernist theorists, and he said, no one has ever heard of a collective that did not mobilize heaven and earth in its comp composition, along with bodies and souls, property and law, gods and ancestors, powers and beliefs, beasts and fictional beings, such as the ancient anthropological matrix, the one we have never abandoned. Um, and so, uh, to go back and quote, uh, Rajesh Kakar from his lecture of a couple of days ago, human beings are born astronomers. Now, a phrase I use to describe uh, the concept of society as intimately connected with the sky is the cosmic state. And I adapted this from the Mesopotamian scholar Thorkild Jacobson, who talked about Mesopotamian political theory as envisaging the cosmos as a state. So cosmic state, is a state in which human society is understood to be an integral part of, or a reflection of, or governed by the same laws as the cosmos. So just to look quickly at some examples of the practice of the ideology of co the cosmic state from the past, if we go uh, back to the beginning of recorded history, then we have an incident from around 2100 BCE which took place in Sumer, now southern Iraq, uh, and it concerned a um, man called Gudia. Gudia was the N, or Lord, of the Sumerian city of uh, Lagash. And a crisis arose in which the rivers Tigris and Euphrates failed to flood, uh, threatening a poor harvest, uh, economic downturn and perhaps uh, famine and political upheaval. So Goodyear took a range of ritual and divinatory actions, uh, including uh, dream divination and temple building. But as part of this process, he consulted the goddess Nanshi. And Nanshi had a tablet of stars. 
And all we know is that Goodyear consulted Nanshi's Tablet of Stars. Nothing else is told uh, to us about uh, this event, but we may assume, therefore, that part of the solution to this environmental and political crisis was uh, astronomical. Uh, Egypt as well, the Egyptian cosmic state, this is well known as Please see Juan Antonio uh, Belmonte's uh, lecture the other day. An image here of the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten uh, around the middle of the second millennium BC. Uh, Akhenaten and his family absorbing the rays of the sun. So the rays of the sun, the healing uh, power uh, conferring benign rays of the sun permeate Akhenaten and his family and then move on to permeate the whole of Egyptian culture. Uh, moving uh, on to the Roman Empire where uh, astrology, uh, astral religion, astral mystery cults were central to uh, uh, Im imperial management of the state. This is from the beginning of the imperial period. The uh, writer Manilius, who wrote the great uh, verse, uh, the pr uh, poem, the uh, Astronomica, said, Augustus has come down from heaven, and heaven one day will occupy. A messianic statement there of supreme power. Augustus himself manipulated uh, astronomical events in order to locate himself at the center of the Roman cosmic state. This is an image of a, uh, a gold uh, aureus uh, that he minted showing uh, Capricorn on the reverse, Capricorn the goat fish. Well, Augustus was born while the moon was located in Capricorn. And this was uh, <clears throat> a very malign influence in terms of the astrology of the time. Uh, my understanding here, therefore, is that um, Capricorn uh, is associated and said to be ruled by the planet Saturn, which in Greek mythology is Kronos, and Kronos was the ruler of the Golden Age in Greek mythology. So Augustus, in displaying Capricorn, is, is sending an iconic image to every Roman who could understand this, that he is the, the lord of the new Golden Age. He stands at the center of a unique coming together of time and space. Now, theory. The great theorist of the cosmic state in Western culture is Plato, who I think was uh, highly influenced by both Babylonian and Egyptian culture. Uh, but what Plato did was set out a complete system for the management of the state in line with what he perceived as cosmic truth. So in his work, Timaeus, he... Uh, set out the theory that the entire cosmos is interconnected, both psychically and physically, and all the cosmos is subject to the same mathematical laws. So in two other works, Republic and Laws, he outlined a system of education government which should bind human society and government into the cosmic order. Uh, for example, in education, uh, astronomy, uh, abstract in, uh, astronomy was one of the highest forms of education in government, he conceived of 360 wise elders ruling the state, in other words, one elder for every day of a year of 360 days. Here, of course, is the classical cosmos which emerged from uh, pl platonic cosmology with the planetary spheres, and we're all used to seeing this model because of uh, it, 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 we, we need to understand the way in which uh, it was conceived that the planets moved on their spheres and influences uh, descended from the stars to Earth. And the four elements were positioned at the center of the whole system. But what is, not, uh, what is often left out of this is that human society, human government, kings, politics are an essential part of this system and inseparable from it. They exist at the center of it. So political Platonism, a phrase you will encounter in some scholarly works on Plato, um, could move in one of two directions. Either you uh, end up with the fair and just rule of the philosopher in the interests of all, that's uh, benign, or you end up with the authoritarian rule of those who think they know best. 
And one person who developed this latter understanding of Platonism was the philosopher Karl Popper, who um, blamed Plato for the development of uh, 20th century Marxism. So here's an example of the application of Plato's cosmic state to theory of divine right of kings. This is from the 16th century British writer Sir Robert Filmer. He said, the divine Plato concludes the commonwealth to be nothing else but a large family. Uh, and he concluded that uh, since the father is divinely charged to rule the family, the king is therefore divinely charged to rule the commonwealth. So direct application a platonic cosmology to support the divine right of kings. However, <clears throat> as uh, views of cosmology changed, so they impacted on political theory. So um, Copernicus, political heliocentrism. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a, a quote which I'm sure many of you know from the opening to uh, De Revolutionibus. So I've just highlighted uh, two sentences. In the midst of all assuredly dwells the sun. So indeed the sun remains as if in his kingly dominion, governing the family of heavenly bodies which circles around him. Now, uh, De Revolutionibus was written at a time when uh, feudal organization in Europe was uh, breaking down, centralized control was building up, and in countries such as France, you get the development of the ideology of the absolute monarchy, of course, reaching its height in the uh, iconography associated with Louis XIV, the Sun King. And this argument was made very well by Keith Hutchison in 1977, who I've cited there. Now, <clears throat> we can move on to Galileo, political Galileanism, I'm calling this. So Galileo moves uh, substantially towards a view of the cosmos as governed by natural law rather than divine intervention. One of his major fans uh, and supporters was the English political philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Now, in t uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, in 1651 wrote his great book, The Leviathan, Matter, Form, and Power of a Commonwealth, Ecclesiastical and Civil, in which he set out a a uh, philosophy of government in which he, uh, he, he described in his own words, he paraphrased in his own words Galileo's theory, which I've quoted here, the universe, that is, the whole mass of things that are, is corp corporeal, that is to say, body, and hath the dimensions of magnitude, namely length, breadth, and depth, also every part of body is likewise body. He, what he's saying is there is nothing that we need concern ourselves with that is not body. In other words, divine intervention is removed, as the universe is run mechanically, so society must be run mechanically by law, and law is designed to restrain human beings uh, maintain, and maintain the kind of order which Galileo has now perceived in the cosmos. And we can then move on to political Newtonianism. Now, no, Newtonianism as an ism is not necessarily uh, the same as what Isaac Newton said, Isaac Newton, as we uh, know, retained a place for divine intervention in his celestial mechanics. Uh, political Newtonianism moved towards uh, an understanding of politics as based entirely on law without God. So this is the, the derivation of political Newtonianism from Newton, quite simply. If the entire universe is governed by one set of laws, then human society is governed by one set of laws, and so kings must be subject to the same law as people. So we get a complete defiance of the uh, Copernican rationale for absolute monarchy. And uh, from this, we derive the natural rights philosophy of the 18th century, which was uh, the philosophy uh, espoused by the leaders of the American Revolution. And this is uh, a... a, a part of the history of ideas ably written up by Carl Becker in his book on the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> Voltaire. Now Voltaire was, uh, and his uh, mistress and lover were responsible for uh, uh, spreading the news about uh, Newton in France. 
and Newton substantially reinforced Voltaire's view that society should be egalitarian. So Voltaire wrote, it would be very singular that all nature, all planets should obey eternal laws and that there should be a little animal five feet high who in contempt of those laws could act as he pleased solely according to his caprice. So human beings are subject to the same law as the planets in political Newtonianism. But political Newtonianism can move also in two directions. It can become democratic in the sense that all are subject to the rule of law, but it can become authoritarian when it absorbs from Plato ideas of order and authority. So political Newtonianism, it was Pierre Simon Laplace, as we know, who uh, removed any uh, need for divine intervention from Newtonian mechanics. Here's Laplace. I've underlined a section of this. It would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. So a society organized rationally on the principles established by Newton must be, for Laplace, ordered and authoritarian. And the person who picked this idea up and developed it was Auguste Comte, the French uh, philosopher, and uh, highly, usually regarded as the founder of sociology. Now, Comte um, outlined in his book, The System of Positive Polity, uh, the attempt to work out how human beings move according to the same laws as the planets. It was very explicit. He references Newton, uh, Galileo and Kepler as his, was his holy scientific trinity. And on that basis, formulate an appropriate system of government in which people are managed in their own best interests according to Comte's Laplacian view of Newton. So uh, sociology uh, in, developed as an explicit attempt to work out how Newton's planetary uh, laws also control the movement of human beings. Having established this Comte thought uh, society could be organized rationally in the interests of all. Sociologists have forgotten this. Um, another of the founders of sociology working parallel to Comte, Adolf Quetelet, the Belgian astronomer, founded the Royal Observatory of Belgium. He was independently concerned with the formulation of a social science based on Newtonian universal laws. And Ketelet's contribution to the debate was very much the idea of deviation. So uh, just as the universe is ordered, he believed so human beings must be ordered. Uh, and therefore, people like criminals who deviate from order uh, in society become, on a larger scale, people who deviate from cosmic order as well. And one has to find ways to uh, stop such human behavior and curb it if society is to be harmoniously organized. So I'm just going to move forward then to some concluding uh, comments to open up maybe a, a little bit of discussion on the way in which uh, post-Newtonian uh, cosmology uh, engages with politics or with the ways in which political thinkers engage with uh, post-Newtonian cosmology. So, um, this is Einstein. Now, I think we can make an argument that Einsteinian cosmological uh, relativity has reinforced notions of uh, cultural relativity. One doesn't need to understand Einstein at all in order to make such um, an argument. All one needs to know is observe the cultural phenomenon. So, simply, if there is no center in the universe, only observers, no one culture is superior to any other. That's the logic. This is a quote here from Lucia Irigare, a French feminist and social theorist, uh, looking at Einstein's theory of relativity. So here we have a political thinker looking at cosmology. Is E equals MC squared a sexed equation? Perhaps it is. Let us make the hypothesis that it is insofar as it privileges the speed of light over other speeds that are vitally necessary to us. What seems to me to indicate the possible sexed nature of the equation is not directly its uses by nuclear weapons, rather it is having privileged that which goes faster. So 
this, uh, this sort of attitude was uh, famously uh, uh, denounced by uh, Alan Sokal and Jean Brickmont in their book Intellectual Impostures in 1998. Um, <clears throat> Hubble, the expanding universe as a metaphor uh, for um, I I insecurity. Well, um, Holly Henry, in a very fine book, Virginia Woolf and the Discourse of the science, uh, science, the Aesthetics of Astronomy, has shown how in the 1930s the notion of the Earth as a tiny point on the edge of a galaxy, um, on the edge of a system of other galaxies, could be used uh, to promote two separate forms of uh, discourse. One was the idea that uh, a sort of nihilist idea that the Earth is so small we are all insignificant, so what's the point of doing anything? Uh, and the other was a more uh, optimistic idea that we all live on this tiny blue dot, you know, the Carl Sagan idea, and therefore we all have to cooperate. The idea that uh, George Miley mentioned earlier. Um, after Heisenberg, well, you know, looking at cosmology in a broader sense, quantum mechanics, um, Dana Zohar and Ian Marshall wrote a book called The Quantum Society in which they used the uncertainty principle as a metaphor for a society in which individuals should no longer be tied, tied to a sort of Newtonian order but can make their own uh, future and their own decisions. Uh, my last example, um, after Apollo, ecology in space, the global village. Well, uh, it's, I think it's generally understood that the images of space from the, of Earth from the Apollo moon landing did have an impact for many people on uh, altering the way in which they see the Earth. And so we have the immediate development of the idea of the global village. So we've got a photograph from 1969 on the left. On the right, a uh, book called The Last Whole Earth Catalogue, 1971, which was uh, a catalogue of uh, the alternative lifestyle that emerged in the late 60s, early 70s. Vegetarianism, living in geodesic domes, giving up money, and so on. Directly um, taking its iconography from the space program. So some terms then to conclude the cosmic state. Cosmovision, another term I like, which uh, Michael Hoskin used in his lecture about Neolithic uh, culture. We do have a modern cosmovision. As our last uh, speaker demonstrated, the the belt built was it as a view of the cosmos develops, a view of the earth develops. The Republic of Heaven, and a, a phrase produced by the English fictional writer Philip Pullman. So the issue then is well, what we're looking at, the construction of political models on astronomical or cosmological principles. And the conclusion, historians of political thought need to expand their horizons. Um, lastly, I'm just going to draw your attention a little commercially to, to other conferences later in the year, the INSAP conference in Venice and the SIAC conference in Alexandria, both in October. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent timing. Thank you. Are there any questions for this presenter? There's a question over there. Please. Yes, thank you for your very interesting talk. I would like to make a comment about modern astrophysics and modern physics. I think an important point which has been uh, developed uh, for a few decades is uh, nonlinear physics. And nonlinear physics is very much used in astrophysics, and there are simulations uh, done by astrophysicists. And these simulations are often more advanced and more sophisticated than what's used in uh, political economy. And uh, so there are groups of people, politicians or economists, who work with astrophysicists. I know some of them. I myself, I, I spoke about that on Monday in my talk. I myself was uh, uh, able to, to do also some work with people uh, in some masters in uh, political economy. And uh, so I think that's something very important because the politicians are used to compute evolution of systems, of social systems and economic systems as a su successions of equilibrium stages. While uh, what we develop is uh, something quite 
uh, different, which is again this uh, simulation of uh, nonlinear effects. So I think so that's something important in the uh, uh, contemporary uh, uh, connection between uh, astrophysics and uh, sociology and politics. Yeah, uh, th thank you very much. I, that, uh, ec excellent information. I'd like if I could just have a word with you about that before you leave. Thank you. Let me ask you a very slightly flippant question. Philip Pullman was undoubtedly a religious statement. Was Douglas Adams, when he decided the Earth was going to be annihilated by the Vogon Empire, was he making a political statement or not? Well, uh, because after all, this is very you can, yeah, yeah, you can you can never tell with Douglas Adams, can you? No. But of course, um, it's an uh, excellent uh, his. That the, yeah, the imminent annihilation of the Earth would be an excellent little uh, uh, basis for a talk in uh, modern uh, pop culture and apocalyptic belief, and I might just do that. <laughs> That's a good point. If there are no more questions for our speaker, let me thank the speaker now with you and all those who went before. And for wonderful timekeeping, we're on time. Thank you very much.